Hello, I'm Ariel Kroon. And I'm Christina Della Rocha. Welcome to Season 4 of Solarpunk Presence. The podcast introducing you to the people working today to create a future we'd like to live in. Because if solar punk as a genre of fiction dreams about the just and sustainable world we'd like to live in in the future, solar punk as a movement rolls up its sleeves and gets down to the business of bringing it about in the present. We hope you enjoy this episode, but first, we need your support. Come join our Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence. For all sorts of good stuff like bonus clips, dispatches, photo essays, and early access to episodes. Or you can spread the word by writing our podcast a review or recommending us to a friend, or you can do both. And be sure to visit our beautiful new website and catch up on our blog at solarpunkpresence.com. And now, on to the episode. Hello, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 5 of Solar Punk Presence. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Jenny Barclay, Professor of Volcanology at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. We will be talking about storytelling in science as a power for good. Hi, Jenny. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. It's absolutely fantastic to connect with you again. Ah, It has been a long, long, long time. Maybe we could start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself as um, either as a geologist or as a scientist or both. I'm, uh, I'm a professor of volcanology currently at the University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich in England. My first degree is in geology, so that means my kind of roots and passion are for rocks. But actually what I really get excited about are volcanic eruptions Over the course of my career, my PhD, I've worked more and more on active volcanic systems and become interested in that intersection between uh, volcanoes and society. So what happens and what the consequences are when volcanoes start to erupt? So I kind of move around between the different spheres, between thinking about rocks and how we can use those to reconstruct what happens in the run up to an eruption. But also thinking about the consequences and how we can do better for the populations who are at risk during the course of an eruption. It's complicated if you have to tell them what's going to happen and when. Absolutely. I think that's where, you know, something that's really challenging, but also quite exciting as a scientist about volcanoes is that obviously a lot of the action in the run up to uh, an eruption happens below the surface where we can't see it. So Mm. what we have to do is put out lots of instruments on the surface and try to detect those changes. And I'm kind of like a detective who uses rocks as well after the event to try and reconstruct what happens. And all of this is because the really key questions that people want to know is, is it going to erupt? What's it going to do when it's going to erupt? And then just as critically, when's it going to stop once it gets going? And these are actually questions that we can't forecast with any certainty. So we can't say exactly what's going to happen. And so working with populations at risk is is really important in terms of kind of having a shared understanding of what might happen and how best to respond. I will avoid making comment about CSI, uh, you know, I don't know, (laughs) Iceland or or Montserrat or whatever, and say, come to my next question because it's completely tied to what you just said, and that's to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself as a storyteller. Oh, that's an in- that's a really interesting question, isn't it? It kind of relates to this idea that perhaps what we have in our head is that always what science can produce is something that is definite, a forecast, uh, something where we can look forwards. And actually, we can't often do that. And one of the things that we have to do is make sense of that. And one of the really powerful ways of doing that and making those connections between the science uh, and the situation that humans find in them is to tell stories. And I guess we all enjoy telling stories. It's one of the ways that we make those connections as human beings. I enjoy telling stories, but also I'm really interested in how important they are for us making sense of these kind of uncertain situations where we have to get together kind of figure out what the best thing is to do with slightly imperfect information. 
Okay, I can vouch for actually you being a good storyteller, <laughs> as I recall. <laughs> yeah. uh, very entertaining. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky when you're a scientist because scientists are not technically supposed to tell stories. I mean, not officially, right? So, yeah. as you just said. Um, so, how do scientists tell stories? What? How can scientists do that in a way that's okay? Yeah, that's interesting. So, of course, in terms of science communication, I think we've known for quite some years that telling of stories, the making of the apparently objective and scientific personal and, and bringing that humanity in is one of the ways in which we can connect with audiences and find ways to share our insights. But actually, what I'm really interested in is the fact that we think we're not storytellers, but really we are. I don't know if you miss going to conferences <laughs> <laughs> these days, but there's the stories that we tell in a scientific paper. Uh, and I think we don't really think of that as a story, but really it is. What, and what we're trying to do is we're kind of creating a plot where we're trying to convince the reader by the end that our interpretation of the whodunit in our results is right. But actually, stories are much better than that because they can kind of wind ways around situations where we perhaps don't know exactly what the answer is or we use it to illustrate things and connect. And of course, as environmental scientists, most of us have a real wonder and admiration for the environment. And a lot of the stories that we tell are ways in which we try to convey that respect and wonder and also some of the very entertaining things that happen to us along the way because things don't always work perfectly. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. oh, but that's exactly right, though. So, I mean, also as an environmental scientist, even if I was never a, a proper geologist, um, <laughs> I always feel like, and I'm not pity and it's not sadness, but it's a little bit of regret. Yeah, that's the right word. That the rest of the world isn't able to appreciate how the earth works because it's just so damn amazing yeah all the pieces fit together and and all the crazy things that happen and you really only can appreciate this if you've spent years and years and years and years studying science otherwise you just don't know this stuff yeah I think that's it's a it's a it's one of the things that makes for me uh I particularly enjoy teaching uh first year undergraduates uh so I work in a university now and I particularly enjoy teaching the first year undergraduates because one of the things that we do is we're trying to introduce them to really kind of the wonder of how the earth works so you can describe how it works but once you kind of start to understand some important pieces in the puzzle so for me things like density or buoyancy or uh, the characteristics of materials once you start to understand that for one domain it fits into the other and suddenly you're really able to understand that and of course what we all find ourselves having to do is when some of this connectivity of how the earth works is starting to move a little bit faster or a little bit more violently <laughs> we all have to go on a crash course to try and understand how it is these little pieces fit together and yet why despite all that understanding we can't accurately put our finger on something and say this this is exactly what's going to happen next so I think um, I find the challenge of weaving that story and trying to ignite that interest one of the most interesting things that I have to do and I haven't perfected it yet either but we we, we try and we try to tell stories through the data but also through what they see happening in front of their eyes in terms of little experiments that we do. It is really, really tricky because stories generally, these kinds of stories, have to be simple. But you're using them to convey information about an extraordinarily complex system. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the... I mean, obviously, I focus predominantly on volcanoes, but I think uh, in terms of broader environmental context, it's one of the key challenges that we have today because the thing as you will know is if you imagine a story is perhaps of the environment lots and lots of people going for a walk and you encounter lots and lots of different people that's kind of like the equivalent of all the different variables that might affect for example a volcanic eruption or climate systems of density compressibility you imagine all of those and if you decide not to talk to one of them they could be the person who's got the secret that allows you to solve the story and that's what's kind of tricky to convey is it has to be complicated in some ways, 
But what we also have to think about is what the most simple things are that we can do or that we can change in order to better understand the system. And I think that's the challenge that we have as scientists, is alighting on the right thing to understand more about. What is it about scientific storytelling that, because I know you study this a little bit, yeah. it interests you. Is it the stories that scientists tell other scientists at conferences, for example, in those 10 or 15 minute talks that you get to give or the little posters that you get to put up? So you have to com convey essentially a narrative about what you're studying at the moment. You know, and you can't waste a single word, although people do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or are you interested in the stories that scientists tell themselves about their own field, like the narrative, the prevailing narrative in their own field that allows them to kind of design their studies and interpret their results? Or are you interested in the stories scientists are telling to the general public, for instance, about volcanic eruptions? Well, so obviously, being me, I'm interested in everything. <laughs> But actually, uh, most recently, what we what we thought was sufficiently interesting and new to study a little bit and think about a little bit more is actually the stories that scientists tell each other. So not the ones where you stand up officially and give a talk, but actually where you kind of meet in a slightly more relaxed circumstance and you kind of unpack some of these things that are going on. So, for example, using volcanoes as an, uh, as an example of an environmental crisis, what we were interested in is the stories that people would choose to tell one another or even their students later on about the moment of a volcanic crisis and what it was that they remembered about it in particular. And that's because a story is really a way in which we make sense of the world. So a scientific project is also that. But a story is usually you have some kind of plot and a point to that story in which you're trying to make sense of the different variables. And the attraction of a story in these kind of situations where there's not particularly one right solution or everyone's working together to kind of try and do the best with in, incomplete information is that it allows you to make inferences from how you're telling it, how you're selecting the different elements and putting them in what order rather than, for example, a scientific paper where you're basically trying to sell your interpretation of events. So we were really interested in the stories that people, uh, scientists were telling each other informally and what they were telling us about the risk situation. So what was kind of the most important sort of information to them and the most important learning that they had drawn from the situation that they were describing in their stories. And what we found, which is pretty amazing, is that not only do those stories kind of help the scientists make sense, but they're creating new information. People interpret and understand. And we even ask scientists to tell stories to each other and sat and listened to how that went. And it's comparison, intercomparison, all these kinds of things that you would see more formally, but actually in that kind of narrative structure. And they're creating huge amounts of information about risk, about the interactions, the things that get in the way. For example, here in the UK, there's a big um, inquiry going on about the responses to the COVID pandemic, and there's a lot of discussion about following the science. And actually, a lot of the information in there was about how the pathway to the best type of decisions get really tricky when you've got both scientific information and social political information that are happening at the same time. And these stories have got huge amounts of knowledge locked into them that tell you about how to try and tread a pathway through that. Yeah, that was tricky, right? Because in a lot of places, <laughs> people decided the scientists were, were the bad guys. It's interesting, isn't it? Because in a scientific crisis, so a crisis that involves some interpretation through science, scientists actually have a certain amount of power in that get, they get invited into rooms and they get uh, asked to speak and asked to present evidence that helps with making the best decision. But also that comes with that is an expectation that you're going to be very certain about that information. Mm. And when facts are shifting quickly and it's a situation that you can't fully constrain, you just can't do that. And it's a very difficult, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult process of kind of negotiation that happens there. And I think scientists need to not offer certainty where there isn't any, but also I think a sort of broader recognition that sometimes we have to do with the best with all the information that we have 
And only following the science is probably going to get you into trouble. But actually kind of negotiating through that and recognising that it's part of the story is really important. When you got your scientists together to get them to tell stories to each other, this was all revolving around a single volcanic yeah. crisis. Yeah, so this is a this was dealing with a particular volcano that I have spent a lot of time working on. So myself and my co-authors, so uh, two of us were involved ourselves uh, during the course of that volcanic crisis. So it was Soufrière Hills volcano um, on Montserrat. And so part of the rationale for that was obviously uh, we sent the scientists what we'd done and um, talked to them, obviously, about how we were going to make that information available. But what we wanted to do as much as possible is try to recreate the conditions in which they would tell different stories. And when we talked to people individually, we asked them just to start by just telling us three stories, what comes into your head and uh, sharing those with us, and then telling us a little bit about the context in which they would tell those stories. Let me give a little bit of background here for people listening. So the, the Soufriar Hills, they're an active volcano complex on the Caribbean island of Montserrat, which is a British overseas territory. And this volcano complex woke up from its dormancy, I guess it was in 1995. Yeah. And it's been active ever since. And it has destroyed Montserrat's capital city, and it's rendered about half of the island uninhabitable as well as attracted a lot of volcanologists interested in studying you yeah. know, this whole situation. Yeah. Um, but between 1995 and 2000, two-thirds of the population had to leave the island. And I guess most yeah. of them ended up settling in the UK. So here you had, obviously, the volcanologists must have been involved in this evacuation of all these people. And and, and also in saying, okay, this half of the island, you just, you, you can't go here anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, so the remarkable thing about the early stages of the eruption was that the volcano basically kept doing new things. So quite often what you would do is you would recognize these patterns of activity from the instruments that you have around the volcano, and then it would kind of whoop, stop, do something different. And the implications for the population um, then became different. And because there hadn't been an eruption in living memory, you know, there was huge amounts of uncertainty right at the beginning. And the scientists were coping with that as well. It's a really beautiful island now. If anyone's thinking about a visit to the Eastern Caribbean, I definitely recommend going to see uh, Montserrat. People are safely settled in the north of the island now. But at the time, people had to move. And the scientists were in a situation at that point as is often the case with volcanology, where the volcanology was being done in very close proximity to the population. We don't look at instruments remotely. It tends to be an observatory. People tend to want to be looking at the deposits. So we're in and around and with that. And so the difficulties that were being experienced were kind of right up there in terms of that experience. We chose that eruption because of that uncertainty and because of its evolution, but largely because of the connections that we had with the scientists uh, who we asked to tell stories so that we could make it as much as possible an emulation of what happened. And the whole idea arose because it's an interdisciplinary project and we'd been working with uh, specialists in the social sciences and the humanities on another project, looking at the cultural and uh, social responses to the eruption. It was through that they were saying, you know, to contextualise what we were doing, we would tell them all these incredible stories about what had happened during the eruption. They were like, you know, there's just so much information here that's hidden. It's not in the scientific papers. It's perhaps, you know, available to undergraduates. We should take a look at this. Especially those first five years, that must have been a very frightening time for people. Yeah. And people must have, you know, lost, they lost their homes, their livelihoods. Yeah. Had, yeah. They had to leave a wonderful tropical climate and move yeah. to the UK. I mean, so yeah. So, uh, and I know, I know you were there. I remember you going off. Was that 1998? Yeah, that's right. Uh, when I was working at the same university as you in the states. Yeah. Yeah. And so that must have really. I mean, so what was that like? What was it like to be there at that time? I well, so I would say, from for me professionally, uh, it changed the direction of my career, and I guess you know the places where I wanted to focus. I think because it had such a profound impact really seeing and understanding firsthand what it's like for people to have to live with that uncertainty and thinking about a volcanic eruption. I think it's important 
there's certainly things that I have changed in my practices over the decades because I I think the ethical implications of what we're doing, thinking carefully about it and the impacts of these eruptions live with people now. You know, what happened, that was now 25, 30 years ago. And this is some, for some people, it's still really now, real now. And so I think being involved in an eruption like that and a situation like that has a very profound influence on you. And I think we're starting to see that now with uh, climate scientists who become involved in some of the extreme impacts of changing weather systems and seeing directly the destruction of ecosystems. These things have a really profound influence on you. They give you a drive, but they also, you know, it, they also really make you pause about why you're doing the science that you're doing and how can you do it better. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, so that's an interesting parallel with the climate stuff, because I think, you know, most people who got into studying it, at least, you know, previously, they were just interested in how it all worked, you know, and then you stumble across this, oh my God, (laughs) what have we done? (laughs) We've added all this, we've insulated the earth with these greenhouse gases and things are warming up. And then this just causes change after change after change Mm -hmm. in the system. And yeah, I mean, it, at some point it'll render parts of the earth uninhabitable to people unless they have air conditioning, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Anyways, and and so as a you know, as a as someone who worked in kind of a climate adjacent field, you know, for decades, we're like, we got to stop emitting, we got we got to stop mm-hmm. burning fossil fuels, we got to stop doing this, got to stop doing that. It's going to be terrible, da da da. And nobody, everyone, no one was interested in listening. And the people who were doing the better job of telling the stories, of course, were the oil companies. Yeah. Oh, those evil scientists, and they just want grant money, and there's no problem here, and plants like extra carbon dioxide. You know, they had all sorts of uh, really compelling narratives. And so I think now in the climate sciences, people are going, well, I guess we should have been storytellers. I And, and I think there's, there's sort of two sides to it, because it's definitely... Absolutely. Storytelling is a really fundamentally wonderful way to share that. And but it's also a really important place where we recognize that natural and social systems are meeting and stories are naturally a tool. We should think of it as, you know, the same thing as a new model or a a fancy new drone that we send up. It's something that kind of really helps us make sense at that interface. And then one of the things that uh, was really striking with the story, some of the storytellers that we uh, worked with during a uh, gathering of the data is that actually storytelling is a really useful way for people to acknowledge the emotion that is involved in being involved in something. Because as scientists, perhaps one of the cultural norms that we have is that we should be unemotional, completely objective in what we do. But if you're involved in a situation like that, you can't help but feel emotional. It has a profound impact on you. And actually stories is one of the ways in which we can kind of work through and talk about these situations. And even we found people, even in very dark moments, would use humor because humor is a good way of diffusing tension and also thinking about, you know, trying to think about the positive things and the learnings. So I guess part of what we're saying is, It's a really important way of conveying that information, but it's also a a really useful way of understanding that situation a little bit. Yeah, what's the therapy speak term? Processing, I think. We're processing it all. And it's but it's interesting because okay, I've never met an unemotional scientist. And I've never (laughs) (laughs) you know. (laughs) Um and they can get very defensive about their own work. I mean, we all can, right? Because yeah. we've put so much work into our work and nobody wants to be wrong, right? So it's hard to be an ideal, you know, the pl- platonic ideal of a scientist. And I think historically, scientists have not been kind to other scientists who tell stories to the public. You know, I mean, for a long time, everyone scoffed at Carl Sagan, right? Because he was on TV talking about billions upon billions or, you know, of stars or in the cosmos or whatever. And but I, but I sense the tide is shifting a little bit. I, I really hope so. I've seen some things published recently about the fact that we should really people who are gifted communicators. And I, I strongly feel that scientists who are gifted communicators should absolutely be cherished and that it's a 
it's a skill in the same way that, you know, some scientists, you know, are absolutely fantastic at coding, right? And, you know, most of us are quite good at quite a lot of things, but you have exceptional talents and we should really nurture the people who have an exceptional talent for communication and also ensure that we make space for it. And I think often the good communicators are fantastic storytellers, whether it's through graphics or the spoken word. I've seen all sorts of wonderful examples. And I think it's remembering that science is also a creative process, but also recognizing that there's a whole flotilla of other types of researchers out there that we can learn huge amounts of things from to make us better at that as well. And so that's what's been really wonderful about some of these collaborations that I've had over the last few years have been actually learning about this and learning about what you can learn from other fields to make that better, to understand better that sphere where human and natural systems collide. Was it because of all these social impacts of this volcanic eruption that you were studying, that you started studying because you were interested in rocks um, <laughs> and how they're made and, and explosive eruptions? So is seeing the social side of that how you came to be interested in storytelling or how did, how did you stumble across this? Yeah, I think it, it, it's exactly that. It's being involved in projects where we're trying to take an interdisciplinary look at different aspects of volcanoes. I think it's as you start to do that, you learn to respect the fact that there's huge amounts of knowledge and information in areas beyond the scientific. You know, so when natural and social systems collide in this something like a volcanic eruption, there's huge amounts of information and understanding and thinking about the social systems, but also kind of that interaction. And so in doing that, you then recognize that one of the biggest, one of the biggest and best ways that you share information across these disciplines is actually sharing stories with each other. And we've all got, you know, a bad scientist story or someone who is, you know, difficult and there's all sorts of things that of how you make sense of how to do things. And often that's the most engaging way that we do it. So that's where the kind of interest in the storytelling came about. And then also the fact, I think, as you say, that in our interconnected, digitally connected world, who controls the narrative often controls the way that huge amounts of people think about these things. And so that's really interesting to think about narratives in that way as well and how how they're used and how they kind of not control, but how they really influence how people think. They have a life of their own. So, you know, yeah. since I left scientists, I've been trying to write popular science and uh -huh. I've been trying to write popular science about science rather than about scientists. So a lot, you right. know, a lot of science. Oh, that drives me. Okay. We won't go down. We won't go there, but that drives me crazy. <laughs> um <laughs> And But what I've noticed is if I need to write about something that's outside of my own field, I only have to read about, say, five or ten, yeah, closer to five, scientific papers in this new area to figure out what the prevailing narrative is. Yeah. And then once you do that, you can actually write, you know, like an entire article or popular science book chapter or whatever on a subject. You know, I mean, of course, you have to read a bit more to make sure you you actually understand all the details of how something works. But it's it's really stunning because I had not realized that that this was the case in my own field, you okay. know, because you're embedded in it. Right. And so yeah. you, you don't realize that you're that. Yeah. What you've learned, when, like when you what you study as a student or even what you pick up as a scientist and what you what you contribute to when you write papers and grant proposals and give presentations is this narrative that's constantly developing yeah and yeah. it's really really interesting i mean it's for good and for bad because it you know you can also overlook interpretations if they don't fit into this narrative right no one's saying the narrative is 100 percent correct obviously it's not because you're always developing it and yeah i think and i think that's one of the things that's so um exciting and compelling although working across disciplines is hard, is, is it's a little bit allows you to kind of walk into the room and sort of go, hey guys, why are you all doing it this way? And they're mm -hmm. like, we don't know, uh, because it says so. <laughs> and just thinking about the different ways uh, that we do that, I think that's how, uh, to some extent, I think that's how and why breakthroughs happen sometimes in that people just kind of go, I, I wonder why we're doing it this way. And I think, you know, it is true that there is a, a prevailing narrative and, and I've talked about one of the societal ones about scientists which is that they all have a solution 
they will have some kind of definite information to proffer. They will have a graph to point to and the end point of that graph will say, and this is what you need to do. And we need to kind of break out of that narrative a little bit. And from a volcano perspective, there's sort of certain things that always pop up. So one of them is, you know, about volcanoes, about super volcanoes about to erupt and, you know, uh, what's going to happen? When is it going to go bang? These kind of expectations that people have about the story of a volcano. We're all loving playing around with AI at the moment. And if you type into it, tell me a story about a volcanic eruption, it will absolutely feed back to you uh, some of the kind of prevailing narratives. One of my favorite one is I asked, you know, tell me something about uh, what happens when this volcano erupts, you know, imaginary volcano erupts. And it was right down to, and the scientist not involved in the study. <laughs> it's always the rebel. <laughs> yeah, it's a set, which is kind of the conventional kind of architecture of a press release when somebody's done a new scientific paper. And I think thinking about these challenges us to think differently and move around a little bit in terms of how we're presenting that information to. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, volcanoes on themselves to some very exciting stories and some really bad movies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the, I have a, a half finished paper from the pandemic, which is basically taking a bit of a relook at the, at the common kind of tropes that you have in these movies and how they feed into sort of cultural expectations of science and scientists. And it's not quite as severe as if you kind of get your data interpretation wrong, you will end up in a lava flow. But more or less, that's usually what happens to scientists in these movies. I think uh, when when we were both in California, there was a couple of the absolute classics uh, released, uh, which was Dante's Peak, which I can remember going to see with everyone uh, back then, so a while ago. But it's still, these movies have an impact on people's yeah. thinking. I'm thinking yeah. about, I, I, maybe it's the other one. I, I don't really yeah, remember volcano, the Yeah, Volcano, the, the coast the... is toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, in that one, it's all about people getting control over the eruption. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, the scientists will come with a bank of computers and kind of raise their hands and you'll maybe get to see a fancy 3D model and then something going erupt, erupt, erupt. <laughs> the, the reality is that's not what happens for us uh, when a volcano is going to erupt. And I think what happened recently in Iceland is a really uh, good case in point. You know, there was all the signs and signals. We know there's magma down there somewhere, but it just decided not to come up. Yeah. Hello. Let me break in at this point and say <laughs> from my vantage point a few weeks in the future from when we recorded this that eventually the magma did come up it made a little made the evening news and all that and was pretty spectacular and then it, it seems to have kind of fizzled back out without doing too much damage and the scientists couldn't be certain fully certain or uncertain about what was going to happen yeah well and you have to be conservative about it because if you say, well, probably not, and then people stay put, and then, you know, then people yeah. die. And, and I think that's one of the, you know, that's one of the ways that volcanologists deal with it is they present different scenarios. And they say, this is the most likely scenario. This is the kind of medium probability scenario. This is unlikely, but it could happen, guys. So we have to be prepared across all of these, because otherwise we're not properly prepared. We think this is the most likely. So they tend to do things. And these these scenarios are all kind of stories. So people can imagine, mm. you know, what's going to happen, how likely that is when we can't offer, you know, it's going to erupt at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, get your umbrellas out for two hours and then it's going to be good. OK, um, well, I'd like to see that umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I shouldn't say umbrella. I'm thinking about nice ash, <laughs> distal ash fall there. Okay. Don't go thinking that umbrellas are safety. Oh, boy, oh, boy. I've told a very bad story there. <laughs> so, don't take was... your umbrellas. <laughs> so what's a good story you tend to tell or that you like to tell or you have fun telling as oh. a volcanologist? It's interesting. I find I was thinking about this this morning ahead of chatting to you and it's hard to choose one but actually one that kind of touches on is this is a story that really stuck with me so in the in the same as the storytellers uh, that we were talking to and it was very early on when I was working at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory in 1996 and, and as you've said 
there was the difficult situation where people were having to face the idea of either moving somewhere on island that was tricky or thinking about moving off island. And as you can hear, even though I haven't lived there for many decades, I'm Scottish. I'm very proud of being Scottish. And um, there was a wee lad, there was a primary school visiting the observatory to come and see the instruments. And there was a wee lad whose family was moving to Glasgow. And <laughs> they said, oh, there's a Scottish girl in the observatory. You should come and chat to her. And, you know, they were only probably seven or eight or something like this. And in that moment where he just said, is it going to rain in Glasgow? And I just kind of looked at him and, you know, it stuck with me a long, long time. He probably doesn't remember it at all. I often wondered about whether he did go to Glasgow and liked it, lives there now. I just thought, how do I explain the profound changes that are coming as a consequence of this volcano? And all that kind of wonder and beauty that we feel and in examining volcanic eruptions kind of came crashing down around my mm. ears. And it was interesting. There was a few of our storytellers told similarly kind of just human human interactions that really make you think about what and why it is that you're framing and asking the questions that you are. You know, how can I do something that means that people aren't necessarily in this acute of a position? where you have to explain not only will it rain, but the rain will be cold <laughs> and it will be quite dark for some of the year and a very different place to be as a consequence of something that the natural earth system is doing and how we are responding to it, of course. Well, I mean, there's only so much responding you can do, yeah. right? <laughs> so when the earth decides, okay, I'm squeezing out some of my interior here. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's... Yeah. That is, yeah. And yeah. then I, I have another story, if you'd like. This is a totally different story, and it's about a historical kind of volcanologist, but actually really scientist, Humphrey Davy. Would you like me to tell that story? Oh, go for it. You go can for always it. edit it out. So, <laughs> so the reason I thought I'd tell this story is because I love this, because Humphrey Davy kind of admitted his hypothesis was wrong, which is something that I think we don't do quickly enough sometimes as scientists. As you say, we do get invested in what we're doing. So he was around the time that they were discovering elements like potassium, which, as you know, are highly volatile in air. And naturally enough, he kind of posited, people were kind of wondering why it is that, you know, lava comes pouring out of volcanoes. Where's this, where's this coming from? Is the whole of the interior of the earth molten? What's going on? People didn't even have a plate tectonic framework at that time in the early 19th century. And he thought, you know what, I wonder if there's a big layer of potassium under the earth that occasionally pops out and that's what's driving volcanic eruptions. And he was like, now, how do I test this? I know I need to go to Vesuvius where there was an active lava flow at the time. I'm going to trog all over there and I'm going to look for the hydrogen because that's the gas that's given off when potassium kind of um, ignites in the atmosphere. And that's what's going to do. And he did all kinds of stuff to try and find that hydrogen. You know, he stomped up and down, shoved things in, ignited things, looked at things, looked at the emission, couldn't find the hydrogen. And there's this just brilliant paper where he describes, I did this, I did this. And all of these things I'm thinking, oh, Humphrey, I hope you were wearing your hard hat. <laughs> and basically, at the end of it, he kind of concludes, do you know what? I think I'm wrong which is just wonderful because at the time there was a lot of toing and froing about other ideas about how volcanoes work and people got stuck in really entrenched positions. And so I really like that story and the story that he told in his paper. It was, it's a really engaging kind of read. If you fancy going to look at it, it's in the Royal Society archives. It's, um, okay. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, and I like that story because it, it's also about the fallibility of science and that you're not always going to have the perfect answers. We spend a lot of time failing and being wrong, but that's part of the beauty of it as well. So I wanted to tell that story too. A lot of us, including a lot of scientists, have the wrong idea about science. Because science isn't about proving that you're right. Mm -hmm. It's about proving that you're not wrong. And yeah. then if you find out that you're wrong, then you have to adjust your idea or your hypothesis. Right? You can never prove that you're right. Yeah, And so you can only chisel away at your idea, getting rid of the bits that that are, turn out to be false and then, you know, get, adding more stuff and then keep chiseling away at the stuff you've added until you end up with something that, you know, withstands 
all your attempts to destroy it. I think and it's kind of about, you know, being robust to that and staying a little bit humble. <laughs> well, it's I mean, it's hard to take the ego out of it. But right. Yeah. Science isn't it isn't about the scientists, although, you know, you still have to you have to compete with all your peers because you need the grant money. And mm -hmm. to, if you want to keep doing science and you need a position and, you, you know, you need to to somehow distinguish yourself from everybody else and exactly. show that you do good work. So it is a tricky tightrope for a scientist to walk. And and it's exactly that kind of narrative, I guess, that you were talking about before that fossil fuels dug into a bit. They're just saying this because it makes them eligible for funding. Yeah. So, you know? And sort of implying that that goes into scientists' own pockets, which is absolutely not the case. No. <laughs> No, I, th I think, uh, yeah, that, that is not the case. But yeah, I think it's true. And I think the, ad the sort of slightly adversarial system where you have to kind of prove that you have the best thing does make it difficult to kind of say, well, OK, but, you know, sometimes then that means I'll get it wrong. And I think some of the best scientists, that's exactly what they're super good at. I'll have to think about that one. I mean, I know some <laughs> profoundly excellent scientists who are not good at that at all. And then, and sometimes you see them like savaging younger scientists mm. in their defense of, you know, their own ideas, even when they're wrong. And you just think, oh, come on, you're like the top of the pile. You don't have to do this. We all respect you. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you just think, don't do this because it makes us not respect you. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. You have to yeah. really have a firm belief in yourself in order to admit that you're wrong. So, but anyways, this has been really, really, really interesting. And thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to me and uh, yeah, good luck with all of your studies and, <laughs> and with all the cool trips to volcanoes you get to make and all the hard, all the hard hats you get to wear. Brilliant. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about a different way to think about storytelling. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and so, until next time. Thank you for listening to Solar Punk Presence, a podcast hosted and produced by Ariel Kroon and Christina De La Rocha. The audio for this episode was recorded in part on the traditional territory of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And in Germany. The opening and closing music for this podcast is Water Cooler Gang, by Monkey Warhol, available for use under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Don't forget to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence. Every little bit helps us keep bringing you discussions and interviews. Until the next episode, keep dreaming. And stay solarpunk. <laughs>